Hello, Dr. Clark. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Good, Dr. thanks. Clark? Good, thanks for joining. Um, sure. <clears throat> so tell us uh, just briefly your name and where, where you practice and where you're located so the audience knows that. I'm not, I know sure. pretty much everyone knows you, but just review it. Sure, sure. So I'm Cheryl Clark. I'm in New York City. My practice is at 61st and Park between Lex and Park. Um, I've been here for a very long time. Before that, I was at the New York Presbyterian Hospital as a professor. Um, so I still go and teach there and go to conferences and... Um, I have a practice that's uh, in dermatology, obviously, in dermatologic surgery. And uh, I see everybody, children, adults, complicated rashes, simple things, acne rosacea, psoriasis. Um, and it takes a sort of, I have a functional dermatology approach to things where I like to try to figure out what the root cause is of what's going on and try to make people healthier. So um, often skin problems are related to what's going on internally. And I also have a very heavily aesthetic practice. So I kind of try to do a little bit of everything. <laughs> yeah, you do it all, right? And then you've done big science. And uh, we learned a lot from you last time. We didn't really get to uh, some other, other areas we wanted to cover. So let's just jump in there. Let's go over the use of... Uh, <clears throat> antibiotics in steroids, uh, but predominantly antibiotics in, in dermatology. Uh, there's a lot of antibiotic usage and what situations do you use it, and what are you doing to reduce the usage and, and why? Yeah, so I'm really glad you asked that because I um, feel very strongly that doctors in general and, um, you know, mea culpa dermatologists specifically use antibiotics far too often. It's very easy to give somebody a prescription for an antibiotic for their acne, and it will make them better. Typically, within two weeks, they'll start to get better. But the end result of that is that the, you know, you're really upsetting the normal microbiome of multiple organ systems, and especially the gut is so dependent upon a healthy microbiome. When you wipe out all those bacteria, the uh, the effects are. Uh, incredible you know you you are you're affecting bacteria that even ultimately end up affecting your brain uh, neurotransmitters um, it's not and more directly you're creating you're getting rid of bacteria they're they're really essential for a healthy gut and being able to absorb foods um, in small quantity in small pieces rather than having a, a situation where a leaky gut develops and and um, large particles of food get in, and then you get immune reactions to that with IgG rather than IgE, and you could, and that's related to a lot of skin inflammation and very unusual rashes such as combined immediate type hypersensitivity reactions and delayed type hypersensitivity reactions all in one patient. And it also can be associated with other um, conditions like rosacea and acne gets worse and um, your allergies can get worse. It's just, it has many, many effects. So I think that we're, it's far too easy just to send a patient out. It's quick with an antibiotic prescription, but we're really not doing people any favors. And the more time goes on, the more we see how we are harming people's health by prescribing antibiotics so much. And it's not a simple matter of increasing resistance, you know, which is another issue. When, you, when you're giving a lot of antibiotics, you're increasing uh, the populations of bacteria that um, can grow despite the uh, presence of those antibiotics. And so then you're making it harder to fight other infections, and some of them are life-threatening, and we're seeing more and more that it's getting difficult to find antibiotics that will treat some of those life-threatening um, infections. And you're also increasing the risk of Clostridium difficile growth in the colon, which can cause um, enlargement of the colon and um, a very serious situation that can lead to shock and even death. And that's becoming more common in hospital populations, uh, especially. But even in the outpatient scenario where people are getting antibiotics a lot, we're seeing the, the growth of C. difficile and us, an incidence of toxic megacolon. So, so I don't prescribe, to answer your question, I don't prescribe antibiotics very often. If I do for acne, it tends to be the new Cicera that is very, very specific just to the 
Cutibacterium or, or the old Propionobacterium acne type bacteria um, and doesn't affect any other bacterial populations. And even that, I find that I don't need to do very often. I might prescribe antibiotics, obviously, for Lyme disease. You know, there are certain situations, syphilis, um, where you absolutely have to, but I think it should be reserved for those situations where there really aren't better alter other alternatives and better alternatives. Yeah, so uh, wide ramification. Uh, it's interesting uh, you mentioned C. difficile. So have you seen C. difficile cases in just treatment of acne, plain acne? No, I haven't. I haven't, but there have been people who definitely, you know, it's much more common in the hospital setting, right? Sure, yeah. Yeah, but it, it has, I haven't personally seen it, but it definitely has been reported with, in, in and, well, the kind of antibiotics that we use in dermatology, yes. Right, okay, okay, yeah. that, I had not heard of that. So C. difficile is a really big problem uh, in the hospital setting. They get multiple heavy dose antibiotics and then Clostridia difficile overgrowths and, and generates the spores, which causes a lot of diarrhea. Yeah, I'm sure you must have seen that in your practice. Yeah, I mean, in, in the hospital setting, you know, when you have somebody on long-term antibiotics, you know, they suffer an infection after surgery or pneumonia, and then that's, that's a huge problem. Right, right. And that's one of the, you know, rare situations where, you know, getting a fecal transplant, getting normal feces mm -hmm. running back into the uh, rectum of a, the sick person actually, you know, saves their life. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So there's this overall um, uh, condition of dysbiosis. That's what you're kind of talking about. And microbes have a huge impact in, in dermatology and in the gut, and they're all sort of in, interconnected. Uh, can you uh, explain dysbiosis in another way? Because there are going to be a lot of drugs coming out where you introduce bacteria to the skin mm -hmm. as we have in, in the bowel. And th that we have in the bowel, you said? Well, well, I mean, we are now introducing, there are new drugs that are being developed that are actually microbes that are being sure. delivered to the skin. It's being evaluated. Whether that'll work or not, I don't know. But Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, dysbiosis creates so many imbalances in, in the organ systems. And um, we really, as time goes on, we're doing more and more testing for small bowel uh, bacterial overgrowth and large bowel dysbiosis. And we're seeing that there's an association between um, this condition and people who have symptoms of GERD or they think that, you know, it's maybe an upper esophageal problem, but it turns out it's really a small intestinal bowel overgrowth and um, bacterial overgrowth. And also the uh, inflammation that results in the gut can cause uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And a lot of times if you take patients who haven't responded to traditional treatments for inflammatory bowel disease and you give them treatments that will reduce their systemic inflammation, including just fish oil and vitamin D and um, healthy bacteria and change their diet, their, their IBS can completely go away. And I think it's also helpful for people who have ulcerative colitis um, to try to repopulate the bowel with bacteria that won't add to the inflammation that's going on. Okay. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the use of antibiotics for acne, but then you flare up with folliculitis on the back? Uh, explain that to the audience. You mean in terms of because of the antibiotic? Because, the because antibiotic. of the antibiotic, there's overgrowth of spritosporum. Or yeah, problems. I was just, yeah. I mean, you can get other unhealthy pathogens like yeast, like candida, and pterosporum ovale when you're treating somebody with antibiotics, especially if you're using them chronically. And you can also select for, you know, maybe the antibiotic you're using is good for staph and for strep, but maybe it's not good for pseudomonas. So you can get um, other, pa other bacteria that can grow, are more likely to grow in, in the uh, hair follicles. And um, that can be very, very difficult to diagnose because it looks like a, it looks just the same as bacterial folliculitis. So right. oftentimes we don't even suspect that that's what's going on, right. but it can be a result of chronic antibiotic use. 
Yeah. And you can also get other rashes like candida under the breasts and the axillary area in the groin. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it definitely, the way that we use antibiotics has definitely had some deleterious effects for the skin as well. Right. And that's where I think uh, a product like Clean can be useful. Maybe you can expand on how you use Clean with uh, yeah, I, I kinda, time you're thinking of an antibiotic or acne. And... Yeah. I feel like I kind of came late to this. Like it's been around since what, 2014, 2015? Yeah. Yeah. And I really kind of discovered it only fairly recently. And I love the idea that you know, the bleach baths are okay for some people, like for people with atopic dermatitis, for example, but they don't always do the job really well. And I love the idea that you're putting, um, in this case, sodium hypochlorite in a non-irritating formulation, and that that can be applied to the skin basically anywhere. And you're getting rid of all pathogens. Um, it, it seems that, I mean, you would know better than I that the testing, all the testing you've done so far shows very, very good log decreases in populations of bacteria such as Staph aureus. And um, I know you're looking at other pathogens like the cause uh, athlete's foot, for example. And you have done the studies that show that the coronavirus increases with just a 15 second exposure, even when it's 50% diluted with the clean product, you see uh, 99.99%, a little bit more than that, of the coronavirus particles are, are inactivated. Right. So I love the idea that you can use something that will, you know, when you have a superficial skin problem, why use an oral antibiotic when you would be just as easily use something that doesn't irritate the skin, doesn't dry the skin, and works probably better without the risk of any antibiotic resistance developing or the risk of other pathogens taking over. Because so far, what we know about these bleach-like products, including uh, hypochlorous acid, as well as um, sodium hypochlorite, is that it seems that everything that we've looked at so far is eliminated. So it seems to be active against a very broad range of pathogens. And in addition to that, from what I've been studying, I've learned that sodium hypochlorite and hypochlorous acid can also be anti-inflammatory. So they can right. reduce inflammation. There's even been some studies that show that it, that it can be helpful for aging of the skin. And I don't know if that's because of a reduction in inflammation, because definitely inflammation adds to aging. I, I'd really like to learn more about that. I don't know if you know more about it. It's quite intriguing. Yeah. As far as aging, as we age, this protein in the skin goes up P16. Yeah. And so uh, sodium hypochlorite reduces P16. And so at least in the rat model, an 18 month old rat turns up to a two day old rat. That's how their uh, skin improves. And so aging is diminished, but at the same time, it also reduces uh, NFKB, uh, which is an inflammatory uh, protein and that's reduced by 50%. So it's anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial. And the design of the product is such that it's, it's short contact. You put it on the skin for a minute or two and you wash it off. So you're walking around all day long without it. And I think what happens, the way I look at it, I'm a cardiologist and, and talking about dermatology, you're, you're the expert, but it's my simplistic mind. I saw so many different diseases where there's one microbe that gets exuberant and eczema at staph and it acne, it's piacnus and, you know, and septderm, it's a yeast. So with that exuberance, all you need to do is shave it down a little bit, tone it down a lot. You can't completely demolish it. You bring it down a little bit temporarily. Don't hurt the skin. Wash it off, and the skin will uh, often flourish, or you will need less intense therapy, less steroids, less antibiotics, or none. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that was kind of the, the concept. And then, I mean, you, you deal with thousands of uh, conditions, and a lot of it is really driven – uh, by micro, that's that's how you know I looked at it. But then anything you do to the skin, whether it's micro needling, laser, you have to go through microbes and deal with it because uh, you, you know you're you're now then injuring the skin temporarily to rejuvenate it. But then you got the microbes and biofilm in between. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, uh, so it's a good thing to do before you do those procedures so that you don't have to worry about causing a secondary infection or. Biofilm 
Yeah. What about the acne form eruption after lasers? As we're just talking a little bit about acne, uh, mm -hmm. why does that? Why does it get so bad? It takes so long to treat. What do you? So I've heard like you know horror stories where it just, you know, like it takes a while for it to get better. Um, well, you can get ac you can get in flares of acne if you have a little bit of an acne lesion and you're microneedling through it or you're lasering through it, it's possible to spread it on the surface of the skin. And then you've got a real problem because you have a barrier that's not intact, plus the bacteria sitting there that can just kind of go a little bit crazy. Um, I think also if you're having anything going on that's increasing the inflammation, you know, it's going to increase acne. I mean, acne is not just because of the bacteria. It's because of a little plug that happens in the follicular apparatus you know, the opening to the skin, and then sebum backs up behind it. Bacteria that are normally there proliferate. The whole uh, uh, follicle ruptures, and then you've got the body around, the uh, connective tissue around it reacting to that and causing a lot of inflammation. So when you get a, a flare-up of acne-like lesions after any procedure, it can be due to seeding of the bacteria, but it can also just be due to uh, blocking off of the uh, the sebaceous follicle from the procedure itself or just from the in additional inflammation that's going on. It can be driving it. Right. Yeah, so we're seeing a lot of use of clean uh, with, you know, prior to laser and microneedling and before and after. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in those uh, in warm conditions or athletes or they've been, a, you know, in warm environments, especially now in the city and other areas, you get a layer of biofilm. Uh, what are your th thoughts about biofilm? Can you explain that to, to the audience and how do you yeah. think about it as a dermatologist? Yeah, I, biofilms for dermatologists who are aesthetic is a scary, is a scary proposition because um, the worst thing that we see is if you inject fillers through a bacterial population you can see that bacteria in the deeper tissues of the skin where you place the filler, and then the bacteria can proliferate and they tend to form a wall around themselves that um, is self-protective in that it doesn't really allow the body's normal mechanisms like the macrophages and the white blood cells to penetrate and clean up and destroy the bacteria. And if it's allowed to develop further, it even becomes resistant to oral antibiotics, it can block off the entrance of the antibiotics to the bacterial colonies. Okay. And, um, this, this is a, it's kind of a horror story because if you induce that in a patient who's had fillers, it can be very difficult to eradicate. The most effective treatment I've seen is to inject uh, 5-FU, which is actually a chemotherapeutic agent, which does kill the bacterial colonies and gets through the problem for you. But the other way to do it is unfortunately with multiple different broad spectrum antibiotics over a long period of time, which wouldn't be so good for the rest of the body, right? The other thing with biofilm and bleach is that you need four times the concentration of a bleach, of a normal bleach bath to get rid of biofilm. So biofilm really, there's no chemical or magical way to remove it. It just is gonna require, you know, some elbow grease some scrubbing and, you know, and a good product and, and, it's really, really important in the athletic setting because they, they're around a lot of bacteria. There's a lot of biofilm on their skin and for them to really be clean. So it's, you know, really need to pay attention to the hygiene. And that's why we love the product in the shower, you know, because you got the warmth, the scrubbing, the, the physical movement and the product and then everything washes off and you're not really. Uh, so when you're when you're in a surgical prep and you're using HIPAA cleanse or Betadine, are you removing biofilm? Yes, I think I think that's the main. Um, yeah, that's why you gotta you know scrub for several minutes. Uh -huh, right, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and for, uh, for, for laser for laser procedures and microneedling procedures, I like the idea of the clean better because it's it's so clean and you don't have to worry about if there's a little residue left on the skin. You know, you wouldn't yeah. want to microneedle through a little residue of betadine or HIPAA cleanse. Yes. Yeah, correct. Correct. And it washes off very easily. So it's designed not to really be adherent where, where with the facial cleanser or the shampoos, we got a little glycerin in there. And so that would be a little more adherent. But yeah. The body wash 
just uh, really, really simple. So what are the other uses of clean products that you've uh, learned to uh, enjoy? And Yeah, I mean, I, I like it for um, hand sanitizing. You know, in, in the time of COVID, it's my number one go-to. I, I personally use myself and that I recommend for almost every patient that comes in here. When the patients come in, we have it in every bathroom. And the first thing they do when they arrive is go and wash their hands for 20 seconds. Okay. Good. We have it in every room and patients use it before we're going to do minor procedures as well, like little injections. And um, I still like Hibiclens and Betadine, but some people are allergic. And I like using clean wash whenever I'm going clean wash whenever I'm going to do fillers because I don't worry about them going to the sink and using it all over their face. Since it's not for the uh, cornea, it can cause corneal damage. I feel that this is safer, and I, I like the data that I've seen so far in terms of the breadth of the spectrum. Spectrum. Of um, so uh, the hand sanitizing issue i like to have people put a little bit on their hands of the one that's the new one that you, that you came out with which by the way i really like a lot the new hand wash has uh, glycerin in it and it has a little di different texture comes out of the pump like really easily it's not like a gel like consistency and it doesn't i have uh, i've had probably i don't know maybe 20 25 patients who have developed either a flare-up of their hand eczema or new hand eczema from using all the um hand sanitizers and probably just from washing their hands more often. And I've switched them over to the Clen, more recently to the Clen one that has the glycerin in it. And they're finding that that's helping them a lot and getting them away from the hand sanitizers. I kind of don't like that the hand sanitizers have had um, problems, you know, with the methanol and the one propanol uh, contamination. Um, so even outlets that we use in New York all the time, like uh, BJ Wholesale and Costco and Target, you know, some of the common places where people might go to buy their hand sanitizer had been selling these um, contaminated uh, products that had a different type of alcohol in them, which is toxic and has been associated, actually has caused deaths and blindness um, in a small number of cases. And actually it was a big problem in, New Mexico because it was very common for people to make their own hand sanitizers in Mexico and apparently in New Mexico and they were using the wood alcohol instead of the uh, regular alcohol and they were also so children were getting into it and adults were drinking it because you know it's a cheap way to get to get uh, to get drunk I guess and um, then the children, the problem with the hand sanitizers with children is that they like the, there's a Hello Kitty brand that's like beautifully colored and uh, it looks like bubble gum. And so kids were drinking it and there was a child actually went blind and there's at least one death in the pediatric population from that. So to me, it's just easier to tell people you don't have to worry about what brand you're buying. You can use this and you know it's safe. And I feel that it probably has a broader spectrum than the alcohol, the 70% ethanol. Um, and yeah. it doesn't dry the skin out or cause rashes. Uh, right. I guess using it for folliculitis um, and for uh, molluscum contagiosum and for treatment of warts, um, where we, for example, with the molluscum and the warts, we are treating over multiple sessions. And in between sessions, the treatment itself, which is called cryosurgery, uses a cold spray that kills the cells that contain the virus, the papillomavirus or the pox virus, and it doesn't actually kill the virus itself. So sometimes you see people who come in with lots of new lesions because they have um, spread it unintentionally as they're doing their wound care or their cleansing afterwards. So if, you, if I, I tell them to use the clean wash, I feel a little bit more confident that they're not gonna get a spread of the molluscum or the warts. Um, since it covers all different kinds types of folliculitis, I'm using that as well for that condition. Um, since it's anti-inflammatory, I like and it doesn't irritate the skin. I like using it for rosacea. Um, because it's anti-inflammatory, I also like using it for acne. And of course, my atopic dermatitis patients, I usually recommend a cleanser called Zero Calm AD, which is 
specifically designed for atopic patients because it has ceramides in it that are missing in atopic skin, and it also has a lot of minerals in it that are anti-inflammatory. But then on a periodic basis, maybe once a week, I'll have them use a clean wash to make sure that they're not colonized with Staph aureus, since that's such a common problem in atopic individuals with eczema, that they are missing, the, they are absent the ability to fight off certain infections like Staph aureus and herpes and um, molluscum contagiosum. So I feel it's very good for them to use at least once a week. So what was the cleanser that you mentioned earlier? The so the other one is made by Pierre Fabre. It's called Zero Calm. Okay. And an AD, like for a, a Zero Calm AD, like atopic dermatitis. Mm -hmm. It has ceramides in it in a very broad spectrum. And it also has uh, the water, which is the main component of it. It comes from a thermal spring in a vent in France. It's uh -huh. very rich in zinc and uh, magnesium, manganese, copper, which are anti-inflammatory. So it actually has been a game changer for my atopic patients. For severe or mild atopic dermatitis, it's by far better than any other cleanser that I've, that I've found in reducing okay. inflammation. And, de and it temporarily repairs the barrier deficit that's there because the ceramides are missing, right? So when, when you right. use it for that day, you're improving their barrier function. There's also a paired cream that has the same ingredients in it, which is not a lotion, but a cream. So it's a, a water in oil emulsion instead of being an oil in water emulsion, which means it's also gonna have a good sealing effect and improve the barrier function that way. And it's, as I said, it's been like dramatically effective for my patients with atopic oh, dermatitis. Oh, fantastic, yeah. That's... Anybody who's having like a reaction to cleansers or products they're using um, I'm recommending it for them as well. But of course, it doesn't have an antimicrobial effect. Right, right. Okay, very, very good. So um, how about seborrheic dermatitis and dandruff? Uh, have yeah. you had use of the... Yeah, I, I feel that seborrhea, probably a third of patients can have a pitosporum ovale component to it. So they have a pathogen there that's adding to the inflammation. Um, most people do well with topical steroids without having to go to the antifungals. Um, but I don't always want to use topical steroids for long-term use, and it is a it does tend to be a chronic condition. So there's a, there's a clean shampoo that has salicylic acid and the sodium hypochlorite in it. So the sal right, right? So the salicylic yeah. acid will help with the scaling component of it and with breaking up the sebum that's part of the of the problem with seborrheic dermatitis is that you have excess sebum production as well as inflammation. And also I believe that the sodium hypochlorite because it's anti-inflammatory can help that condition. So I'm telling people to either use salicylic acid shampoo like the Neutrogena T-cell brand or a zinc shampoo like the Head and Shoulders or the, the Clen shampoo with the salicylic acid and the sodium hypochlorite. And um, probably more often now I've been using the clen because I've learned about it fairly recently and people are liking it. It doesn't have the potential side effect that the salicylic acid has of changing the hair color if you happen to color your hair. So that's, that's an advantage. Yeah, the salicylic acid concentration is pretty low. It's 0.5. And yeah. the synergy between salicylic acid and sodium hypochlorite we found, it has a little glycerin. And, it, and some people really like it as an overall body wash as well. Yeah. Um, so Does that make be, the pH a little lower? The fact that you've added pH is, yeah, yeah, pH is lower. It's uh, six zero or six three. Okay, all right. Um, is that too yeah. big, a little bit of hypochlorous acid present in the formulation then too? Uh, it it probably migrates to that. Yeah, we start with mm -hmm. sodium hypochlorite as the pH drops, it goes to hypochlorous. Yeah. Yeah. It's the it's the cocktail, and you know we've talked about. We're not exactly sure which one is doing the work, but in synergy, they seem to, you know, work work really quite well. And that's a really popular uh, product and growing really fast. We have the acne cleanser, which has salicylic acid and sodium hypochlorite, but no glycerin. That's a really popular product now. Then we're in the clothing. I don't know if you've used that yet or not. What's the percentage of salicylic acid in that? In the acne, it's point yeah. five. It's point five. I haven't yeah. tried. Yeah, that's good. That's good to know. Yeah, yeah, we'll uh, send some of that to you, and it doesn't ruin the people's clothing or towels or.
pillowcases. Yeah, great. That's good to know. Like even yeah. if they get close to sun, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's no right. sun in either. Right. So, um, so good. All right. Well, that was a good uh, overall um, coverage of you know the clean products and in your practice. Uh, what it what is going on in your in your practice uh, with with COVID? Are you pretty much back to being fully open and we we never closed completely we were open two days a week through re, through march april and then on may 1st we opened up to our normal schedule we're seeing far fewer patients there's a couple of reasons for that one is that we want to um completely sterilize between each patient you know the rooms and, and we want to circulate our our air through a filter that removes all all, all covid uh, viral particles. And another is that a lot of my patients are, um, you know, they have second homes in Long Island or upstate or out of the country. <laughs> right. And so they're still reluctant to return to New York. I think being outside of New York in a way can be a little more scary than being in New York and seeing what's yeah. happening. And the unknown can sometimes make it harder for people to feel confident. When you're in New York, everybody's wearing masks. We just had our mail delivered by our mail carrier who's wearing a mask. And, yeah. You know, people are being really, really good about it. And it's kind of, I mean, I hate to say this, but we're in the middle of a very tragic situation, right? But in every tragedy, you always find silver linings, correct? Right. So it's kind of exciting to see what's happening to the streets of New York. I mean, every restaurant has taken over a full lane of what is normally street. And there's oh, really? no telling them not to do it. Yeah. So you walk down the streets and there's restaurants on most streets, sometimes right next to each other. And the ones that don't have a restaurant right next to each other have just taken over the street in front of whatever establishment is next to them. Yeah. Whether it's a parking lot or a dry cleaner, you know, or a grocery store and nobody seems to care. And so there's these huge sidewalk and street restaurants. Yeah. Some of them are bigger than what was inside before. Right. And they're filled with people. Yeah, yeah, you know? fantastic. fantastic. So it, it has kind of a, an interesting vibe. When you walk around, it's kind of yeah. exciting. It's a little bit more European. More European, yeah. 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 So, so what, do you, uh, what do you think of the vaccine? What are your thoughts there? You, I know you read, you're a prolific reader, and you watch the news. And yeah. What are your thoughts there? Well, first of all, I'm a big believer in vaccination. You know, I don't believe that there's any evidence that it leads to autism or attention deficit disorder. And um, as a matter of public health and just to, you know, to be a mensch and to be a good person, I think we should all be getting vaccinations. And this year, I really believe in the flu vaccine. I think that's going to be very important for keeping things straight and, think, and keeping people who have the flu out of the emergency rooms where they might pick up COVID from patients who are there with COVID and just helping us to understand what's what and not be confused. And the vaccine, I'm not gonna jump to, to take if it's being introduced in such a way that I think it may be political rather than scientific. Yeah. You know, I wanna see the science behind it yeah. before I'm gonna recommend it for people or do it myself. Right. I don't know how you feel about it. What's your feeling? Yeah, no, I feel the same way. I think we need to look at the numbers. Uh, the companies are very large and ethical, you know, Pfizer, J&J, Moderna, they're not going to take chances on putting, uh, you know, something out for political reasons. They can't. I mean, there are too many people watching it. I think there's been a lot of fear mongering about that. It's nearly impossible. And they have a lot to lose. You know, if you are a multinational, multi-billion dollar company, you're going to get sued if you put something bad out and you can't. So there's a lot of people with FDA looking at it. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a data safety monitoring committee. I mean, those are all determined ahead of everything, you know, so there's triggers. Uh, and it's very hard to stop a trial early. Now, you could stop a trial because it's very, very effective or very bad. So if they see that, the signals, then they'll see it. But I think we'll, we'll have an answer. And, you know, hospital workers, especially overweight hospital workers, mm -hmm. definitely could have it, you know, elderly, nursing home, maybe over the age of 70 or, you know, 60. Uh, so I'm excited uh, what it's going to, you know, really bring. And then, you know, the face mask is a new seatbelt, you know, not a, yeah. 
not a big, uh, you know, I think other, other cold and flus will go down, you know, if we mm -hmm. adopt that as just part mm -hmm. of hygiene. Yeah. I'm sure people are making it a fashion statement too. I mean, there's lots yep. of advice though. To, um, Absolutely. And if people start thinking more about their health and their diet and yeah. there's so many more, finally the news is reporting on the benefits of vitamin D. And you yeah. know, if we can get our vitamin D tested and supplemented, you know, who knows, I think there will be fewer colds and, and flu. Yeah. And yeah. It, it so, so, so tell me quickly the regimen, your multivitamin regimen. I know you're really strong in this. So just review that quickly for the audience. What, what do you like to For with? COVID or in general? In general. Yeah, in general, I think that there are probably the big three that are good for everybody, no matter what. Maybe four, actually. The big four are vitamin D3 and magnesium and fish oil and probiotics. Okay. And... A lot of this has to do with evolution, but also the way that we live, our industrial society, and the quality of the, or the lack thereof of the food that we eat, and the fact that we process food. So yeah, the vitamin D3 should be taken in a dose that gets you up to a level between 50 and 80 nanograms per ml. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because the old standards were up up until like 30. Like if you were between 20 and 30, that was considered to be adequate, but we actually know that's not true. Um, I'm, I'm friends with a very well-known scientist who did, who's done work on vitamin D her entire career and has written books about it. And one of the studies she told me about that was fascinating was she was in South Africa and she um, checked vitamin D levels on on uh, dark-skinned Africans who were spent a lot of time outdoors versus ones who didn't, and discovered that those who had a very low level of vitamin D3 in their blood, she drew blood from them and mixed it with um, HIV and white blood cells and discovered that their white blood cells became infected at a much, much, much lower rate if they had a vitamin D level between 50 and 80 as opposed to having a level below 30. So I thought that was really fascinating. And so, so wait, wait, that the normal level had more infection? No, the, the, the patients who had a level between 50 and 80, the fewer of their white blood cells became infected with HIV. Fewer, got it, yeah. okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Really, really interesting. And it has to do with how we've evolved and when we, when we had hair and then when we lost our hair and when we left equatorial Africa and when we transported by force, you know, equatorial Africans to South America and the United States to be slaves and, and how um, we don't live in equatorial Africa anymore. We don't get enough sun. We're not outside as much as we need to. So we all are suffering from vitamin D insufficiency or deficiency. We don't eat. You know, even when man um, migrated north and east, the diet changed where we're eating more polar bears and seals and sardines and mackerel, which are very, very high in vitamin D. So the dietary alterations allowed humankind to stay healthy, but we don't have that kind of a diet now. So all of us need to be supplementing. Right. I, I've never How much do you we at a normal level. So would you go on it just prophylactically or actually check the level first before you go on it? Ideally, I would like to check the level first. I know some people are still reluctant to go to their doctor's office. If your doctor is careful the way we are here, I don't think you need to be concerned. But at minimum, what you should be doing if you, don't, if you can't get the blood test yet is you should be taking 5,000 international units a day of D3 okay. and then get your blood tested within three months, I would say, to see what okay. level. Yeah, um, and you can't take too much, you know, so there's a limit because it's fat soluble. It can, yeah. It can, you, can, you can get toxic to it. So you've got yeah. to. And, and you have to, if you have a history of kidney stones or high calcium, you know, if you yeah. had sarcoidosis, for example, you might have high calcium, otherwise it's pretty uncommon. Um, then you would want to do it under a doctor's supervision. Right. And the one other area is that. Or, or kidney failure also, sorry, or kidney failure. Yeah. 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 So I, I think I think it's best to you know, get it monitored and, you know, mm -hmm. find a really good program because, you know, supplements do cause, you know, problems. We can go over that some other time, yeah. you know, yeah. they've been associated, you know, prostate cancer and so on. And, and, but I think taking it sensibly magnesium, I'm interested, uh, how much do you recommend that? 
Uh, just a, a magnesium glycinate is probably the best form of magnesium in terms of it not um, causing diarrhea or constipation. Um, and if 300, 300 okay. milligrams is fine, like just a standard pill, you know? Yeah. And magnesium it, it is one of my favorites as a cardiologist. It helps you sleep, relaxes yes. the vessel, lowers blood pressure. Uh, yes. First thing. And um, the fizzy form, you know, if people are constipated, actually can help them with that as well. Yeah, this magnesium citrate is great if you're constipated. Yeah, right, right, right. So, and but the beauty about magnesium is if you take too much, you get diarrhea, you stop taking it. Exactly. And your kidneys flush it out. So, uh, yeah. And it's such an important co uh, cofactor for so many enzymatic processes in the body. Right, right. right. And right. even including the production of collagen, by the way. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, so you've got calcium, magnesium, probiotics, so in fish, oil. in fish oil. Okay. Which I know that you're, you must be very much in Yeah, we like it. I just like to, to eat fish, you know, not non shell yeah. fish, fish. Yeah. yeah. Um, very good. The other thing, as far as people getting healthy, is that fat tissue in humans have more ACE2 receptors. Uh huh. So virus really can attack mm -hmm. and if you see in the young people especially hospital workers that have passed uh it's it's obesity you know um often they have obesity yeah and the single best measurement in health is the waist size you know yeah and men, uh at the belly button if you're 40 inches or above they have more heart disease cancer and death mm -hmm. rates women over 37 at the belly button uh, more cancer, more breast cancer, ovarian, heart disease, stroke, et cetera. So I think as a nation, we've got a, this is a good opportunity to get people healthy. It's very difficult to talk about. Sure. Uh, obesity. You don't need to be pencil thin. Sometimes you could be too thin or have, don't have the right diet. I mean, but watching the waistline is really. Uh, right. And it's very easy to say and not so easy to do, but, you know, probably the, if we all just, if we didn't have those options of the, you know, obviously people need to have hormones checked to make sure they're not hypothyroid or there's some medical reason for it. But if we didn't have so many inexpensive, unhealthy foods available to us, you know, it takes more time and it takes more money to eat a healthy diet. Yeah. You know, processed foods are actually been made to be very cheap because of the corn and soybean subsidies we have in the United States. Mm -hmm. where we're making huge tracts of land and filling them with corn and soybeans rather than, you know, vegetables that are rotated and where the soil is kept in a more, you know, with more nutrients. So it, it becomes, it, it's become very inexpensive to buy a McDonald's hamburger and French fries, you know, for a couple of dollars as opposed to buying a piece of fish, which can be 10 or $15, you know? Um, yes. So it's a, it's a political issue as well as a, uh, it's not just an issue of willpower, obviously. Um, it's a matter of education and making things more affordable for people. And somehow the, the lobby power of the big companies that make all these processed foods that are so bad for us, you know, I don't know what you can do about that. You know, if we lived in a little mountain town in Greece, we would be eating fish and tomatoes and vegetables right from the soil yeah. outside, yeah. which is very high in minerals and nutrients. Yeah. We don't well, have yeah, COVID has made us, uh, you know, a little bit more communal and, you know, we're eating together more and spending more time cooking at home. And we've seen in cardiology that people have actually gotten healthier because they're not going out and they're eating at home and they're spending time with the family and being more thankful. Um, yeah. 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 Definitely. Well, very good. Listen, I've had a great time. I'm sorry about the technical issues that we That's had. Okay always have such good information so yeah i always like talking it. to you as i hope we can do it again soon yeah absolutely all right well, okay i've been with, uh, talking to dr shara clark thank you everyone thanks for putting up with all the technical issues and uh, we'll hopefully do it again with thank her. everyone who's listening if anybody has any questions please feel free to reach out to me via instagram i'm very happy to 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 get back in touch with you and let you know anything you want to know about that we discussed and if you want to know about healthy supplements, they're actually, it is important to get them from a reputable source because as you know, there's a lot of contaminants in a lot of supplements that we buy and mm -hmm. many of them don't have the levels that they purport to have. So um, yeah. we give you advice in that regard as well. Okay, so, yeah, I'm gonna actually email you 
for you to get me a little package going. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank Bye. you.